I always like to say shalom, y'all. It's good to be here. And um, I'm going to be talking about the history of Christian Zionism. This is going to be a little different than most of the other talks because I'm going to be showing you the, the impact and the people that God used to bring about in the last days an awareness of Israel as opposed to the historic view of the church, which is to replace the church with Israel and say that Israel has no future. And of course, down through church history, that produced anti-Semitism within the church and replacement theology. But God has been working in the last four to 500 years to change that. And uh, there's an author named Timothy Weber. He wrote a book, uh, on the road to Armageddon, how evangelicals became Israel's best friend. He's a guy who, when he was young, uh, went to college at UCLA and really admired Hal Lindsey, who was on staff with the crusade, but as he got his PhD, uh, he became enlightened and you know now looks down on, on all of us who uh, hold this view. But nevertheless, they have about a dozen or more books out there, and they all have the word Armageddon in it, like, because we believe in Bible prophecy, we're all marching everybody toward Armageddon. And uh, there was a movie that just came out a while back called Waiting for Armageddon about our prophecy beliefs, and yet nobody in the movie ever talked about Armageddon. And uh, we would like for people to know that we're not waiting for Armageddon, we're waiting for Jesus to come back and take us to be with himself. But somehow that gets garbled uh, when it goes to the secular media and they, uh, people like Rosie O'Donnell say that we are the most dangerous people on the planet. Did you know that? <laughs> Turn around and look at your neighbor. <laughs> and realize how dangerous that person is sitting next to you because you believe in Bible prophecy. And so you're a really bad person. But Weber wrote about how evangelicals became Israel's best friend. I think that's great. I don't know about you. Uh, and he says, but I say, but only half of the story is told in his book because he starts it 200 years ago when it really started in the 1500s uh, as the Protestant Reformation began to uh, arise. And we see in Genesis 12, 3, that it records God's promise to bless those who bless Abraham and his descendants. In other words, and this Abrahamic covenant is confirmed to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants and re is repeated in Genesis alone to them at least 20 times. And every one of those talks about the land, the very thing that they're trying to divide and give away, as Pastor Hibbs talked about earlier. And yet God focuses on the land. And guess what? The church was never promised any land. We're a people from all the nations, including Israel, the remnant, and we're together in Christ. That's why the, that's the theological purpose for the rapture is to remove the church so that God can finish the incomplete 70th week of Daniel where Israel is going to be the head over the nation and not the tail. And we will reign and rule, of course. We're part of that plan as the bride of Christ, but we are not the final phase of history. And uh, although the Abrahamic covenant contains multiple features of stipulation, it always includes the land promises to Israel. So one of the most important questions that must be addressed is, does this promise still stand or has it been changed? If these biblical promises are to be taken literally and still apply to Israel and not to the church, it should not surprise anyone that such a view leads to Christian Zionism. Now, I'm going to define these terms. What is Zionism? Well, Zionism is simply the desire for the Jewish people to occupy the land of Israel. The word Zion and its different forms are used over 100 times in both the Old and the New Testament. And it's providential that God led the Jewish people to use, select this term Zionism for the movement that, dis, that led to the return of them to the land. Because the word Zion, as it's used 
in the Bible has a very positive, victorious connotation to it. It refers to the area where David, just across the valley from the Temple Mount, built his palace 3,000 years ago. It then becomes known for the whole Jerusalem area, and sometimes it's used to refer to the Temple Mount, and even a few times to refer to the land of Israel itself. And so Zion, in the context in which it is used, uh, refers to the idea of Israel back in the land reigning with the Lord, and he's there and present. So it's a positive, optimistic term in the Bible. Now, in the United Nations, it's a cuss word. The Zionist pigs and all of that kind of stuff that you hear all the time. So I am a Christian Zionist, and what's a Christian Zionist? Christian Zionists are Christians who desire for the Jewish people to occupy the land of Israel and to come back to their land so that God can fulfill their promises to them. And uh, that's why I support the modern state of Israel. Actually, uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is enough to support it, but when you add the prophetic element, uh, there's all kinds of reasons. Here, here's a uh, Muslim, Amir Zare, who talks about the dangers of Christian Zionism. And he says, the real support for Israel among conservative Christians lies in a sort of religious extremism. That's us. <laughs> After the 1967 Six-Day War in which Israel grabbed all of Jerusalem, I mean, can you imagine the Jews getting Jerusalem? I mean, if it wasn't for Israel and the Jews in the Bible, we wouldn't even know if Jerusalem existed. And for hundreds of years, the Arabs had a chance where nobody was obstructing them, for them to uh, give significance to the city of Jerusalem, and they never have. You know, the, the Arabs are kind of like a three-year-old child. You know, you buy him a present, and he unwraps it, and he plays with the box. And little brother comes along and starts playing with the toy, and then the three-year-old wants to play with the toy because his brother is playing with it. Islam is based on jealousy. And because the Jews are returning to the land and give value to Jerusalem, then all of a sudden they want to have Jerusalem. <laughs> so they say that's what it's all about. The religious beliefs of the Christian right push their support for Israel, which would not be so bad except that their religious beliefs are highly anti-Semitic. Did you know we're anti-Semitic because we love Israel? The hope is that Jews will regain control of the entire Holy Land and resolve their, uh, restore their kingdom, prompting the Messiah to return. I'm sorry, that's not what we believe. Uh, we're, nothing we do is going to prompt his return. That's what he told his disciples in Acts 1. He's coming. There's a day set in which he is going to return and do these things. In fact, it's the Jewish people who will prompt the second coming of Jesus Christ because the second coming is a rescue event to rescue the Jewish people who are on the verge of being wiped out, not us Christians. So what lies ahead, what lies behind the Christian right support for Israeli's action is not a belief in the existence of a Jewish state. It's not. Uh, but rather a faith in the eventual destruction of Jewish people. I'm sorry. Who do you think is going to dominate the millennium? But, you know, this is the way people are. They go through and they pull out this and pull that out, and they leave this and they leave that. And so this is typical, and you're not surprised that this was published in the Michigan Daily. Now, what did the early church believe about Israel? Irenaeus, who is one of the most orthodox early church fathers, he was a very strong premillennialist. He believed in a future seven-year tribulation and all this said, but when this antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months and sit in the temple at Jerusalem, and then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom. That's a very accurate premillennial statement. But even Irenaeus believed that all of this would occur through the church he did not see Israel as Israel uh, co conquering these kind these issues. So the early church, and, and this is some of the best of the early church fathers, believed that the church was still dominant over Israel. 
And uh, we see uh, one scholar said, what is singularly absent from early millennial schemes is the motif of the restoration of Israel. See, it took 1,800 years until a distinction was made between Israel and the church. It took about 1,500 years in the church to see a restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land, which is all throughout the Bible. The church fathers from the second century on did not encourage any notion of a revival of national Israel. In fact, I could go into detail about how they, they linked the veracity of Christianity to the fact that Israel was never going to be a people again and uh, various I issues like that. And so that's what the, basically the early church held. Now, as you move into the medieval church, uh, their eschatology saw a row for the Jews in the future. It was one of subservience having been absorbed into the Gentile church. Medieval prophetic thought provided no real distinct future for the Jews as a regathered nation of Israel, certainly little that could be labeled as Zionism. However, toward the end of this era, there were a couple of medievalists who taught some kind of future for national Israel. And uh, Joachim of Fiori, he is a watershed in medieval eschatology, and he is the person who started developing what is called historicism. Uh, which is a belief that the events of Revelation 4 through 19 are being fulfilled through the church age. And so the 1,260 days in the book of Revelation, which we as futurists and see them as, a, or, or we see them as 1,260 days, they saw them as 1,260 years. And so everybody knows that the Antichrist arose in 606 because the Pope was the Antichrist, and successive popes were the Antichrist, so that was Pope Gregory. And it just so happened, 1,260 years later, happened to be uh, 1789 when the French Revolution occurred, and so that was the fall of Antichrist, right? Well, not exactly, but this was the scheme that he introduced, and, and it was dominant throughout the Middle Ages. And even though some think that Joachim could have been a Jew, of Jewish descent, his thought is typical of the non-Zionist views of the time. Quote, the final conversion of the Jews was a common medieval theme, but one of the peculiar significance to Joachim, notes Joachim is scholar Marjorie Reeves, a British lady. It was popular in medieval eschatology to see a future time in which, quote, Rome was to be the temporal capital of the world and Jerusalem the spiritual capital. Uh, the great rulers of Jewish history, Joseph, David, Solomon, uh, Zerubbabel, were interpreted as a priestly rather than imperial sense, note Reeves. In other words, uh, they, were, they were Christianized. They weren't political leaders as the Bible does. And here is a guy, Sandonio, about 1255, taught that some Jews would be blessed as Jews in the end time and return to their ancient homeland. But an important fact to keep in mind from this era is in 1290, England expelled the Jews from England, and they were the first European nation to do that because of the tremendous anti-Semitism that had developed in England at the time. And also it was during this time that it, the British came up with the idea of the uh, blood libel, you know, that the Jews had to kill a Gentile and get the blood and mix it into their matzvah and stuff like this. The Arabs are big into this uh, today, uh, at least the Arab Muslims. And so along comes the Reformation, and so the flourishing of millennialism and a belief in a future return of the Jews to their land often go hand in hand. Uh, this is evident in the second generation reformers begin to fade. Thus to date, I have not been able to find any reformers who supported the restoration of the Jews back to the land of Israel. Such views must await the post-Reformation era However, the Reformation in many ways prepared the way for the later rise of Christian Zionist views. How did, that, how did they do that? Well, the, they did it in this way. The growing importance of the English Bible was a concomitant of the spreading Reformation, and it is true to say that the Reformation would have never taken hold had the Bible not replaced the Pope as the ultimate spiritual authority. With the Bible as its tool, the Reformation returned to the geographic origins of Christianity in Palestine. It, it thereby gradually diminished the authority of Rome. In other words, the, the Reform, see, see, in Catholic or Greek Orthodox view, the, 
Jerusalem and Israel is the Holy Land. That's a Catholic view. In the Bible, it's Israel, Jerusalem. In other words, it's a real geographic place. It's not a holy land ooh, type thing, you see. And uh, we go to Israel to visit. Catholics are going to the holy land in the same way that Mecca is holy for Muslim. Uh, thus, so it would come to be that the provision of the Bible and the language of the people would become the greatest spur to the rise of Christian Zionism. Wow. Do you realize for the first 1,500 years, the average person didn't know what the Bible taught? Only one in two and a half thousand people on average in the Middle Ages could read. Even the Catholic priests, most of them could not read. They just learned to memorize the Mass and quote it in Latin. So just think, if you're an average person in the Middle Ages, you did not know the details of the Old Testament, the stories that, you know, from Samuel and Kings. And you just had the big idea of creation, the flood, you know, and you learned much of what you learned from the t stained glass windows, the 12 stations of the cross, and plays that were put on in your area. And so finally, around 1500s, for a lot of reasons, you begin to have the Bible being translated into people's language. And that caused, especially in England and throughout Europe, a revolution known as the Protestant Reformation. So this simple provision of the Bible in the native tongue is what gave rise to their incessant reading and familiarization of it, especially the Old Testament. And it was fertile soil that yielded a crop of Christian Zionism over time. So, to me, that's a very powerful argument that all of a sudden people start reading the Bible and they start taking Israel to mean Israel. Imagine that. Throughout the Middle Ages, it was popular for those who had the means to attempt a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Once again, ooh. Uh, upon returning to England, some would write detailed accounts of their journey. And these kinds of books were popular during the Reformation and beyond and helped to engender interest in the land of Israel among the English. Uh, when both scholars and laymen alike generally for the first time in the history of the church had the text of scripture, both Old and New Testaments, more readily available, it led to greater study, a more literal interpretation, and a greater awareness of the Israel of the Old Testament. See, Israel moved away from being this mystical holy place to a real place. Just think, you're able to read all the details and stories of real events that happened in the Old Testament, you see? And, and it has the feel and texture of real people and real, you know, of things that really happened. You know, just like Bible prophecy in the future has the texture of details and complicated events as if you were going back and studying Samuels and Kings and Judges and you were trying to think about it as real history. So future Bible prophecy has the same details when taken literally. And uh, this provided the atmosphere in which a major shift occurred in England, also on the continent to a lesser degree, from medieval Jew hatred, which led to the expulsion of all the Jews from Britain in 1290, to the in invitation under Oliver Cromwell to return in 1655. If you go to London today to Westminster, there's two statues in front of Westminster. Richard the Lionhearted, by the way, who started a lot of the anti-Semitism because of the Catholic Crusades. The other is Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector, who was a Protestant Bible-believing Christian who re demanded that the Jews return to uh, England. You want to know their logic? Their logic was the Bible teaches that Jesus cannot return until the Jews have been scattered to every nation on the planet. And then the Jews would be converted and then Christ would return. So because England had expelled the Jews, they were preventing the second coming. And so they needed to bring the Jews back to England. Sermons were preached in, in Westminster uh, to this effect by people like John Owen. But 
It wasn't just any group of Protestants that provided a fertile soil for Jewish restoration doctrines. It was out of the English Puritan movement that this belief sprung. Now, Puritan doesn't refer to sex. It refers to purifying Christianity of Roman Catholicism. In other words, purifying Christianity by getting rid of the idols and uh, the idolatry of worshiping Mary and all of this kind of stuff. It meant going back to a pure biblical view of Christianity, which includes living a pure life sexually, but that wasn't what Puritan refers to. Starting with the Puritan ascendancy, notes Barbara Tuckman, who is a Jewish lady who wrote a great book called The Bible and the Sword, um, and she won a Pulitzer Prize later for other history books. She said, the movement among the English for the return of the Jews to Palestine began. Why the Puritans? Puritans were not just dissenters, they were a Protestant sect that valued the Old Testament to an unprecedented degree in their day. Uh, she says that they began to feel for the Old Testament a preference that showed itself in all their sentiments and habits. They paid a respect to the Hebrew language that they refused to the language of their Gospels and of the Epistles of Paul. In other words, they preferred Hebrew over Greek that the New Testament was written in, which is a slap in the face of, of Roman Catholicism. They prefer Latin, neither Greek or Hebrew, you know. Uh, they baptized their children by the names not of a Christian saint, but of the Hebrew patriarchs and warriors. They turned the weekly festival by which the church had from primitive times commemorated the resurrection of her Lord into the Jewish Sabbath. They created what is called the Christian Sabbath, where they still met on, sun on Sundays, but they uh, implemented a lot of the Mosaic Sabbath law keeping, which I personally don't agree with, but nevertheless, this shows you the uh, degree that they uh, did this. They sought for precedence to guide their ordinary conduct in the book of Judges and Kings. In other words, these Old Testament stories. They would often see current events that happened in England, and they saw themselves like Israel as this little island being persecuted by the rest of Europe. And so they would see when things happened in England, they would say, hey, this is like what happened over here in Samuel, you see. And they weren't saying that they were Israel. They're just like us who see similar events between what was happening because they now had access to the, the Old Testament and the details of the Old Testament. And so uh, this was part, became part of their uh, Christian culture. And they created what we call Judeo-Christianity. You don't think these medieval anti-Semites would have created a Judeo-Christian culture, do you? No, it was the Protestant Puritans who began to do this. Uh, and so we see the study of Hebrew became paramount. In fact, when the Puritans came to the United States, most of them were graduates of Cambridge University. Cambridge was the hotbed of Puritanism in the 1600s. And they were very well-educated people. And they started their first university in the United States called Harvard. Did I say that right? <laughs> and they named the town that Harvard was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And do you know that the original logo for Harvard was written in Hebrew? And they didn't even offer Greek for the first five years of Harvard. They only offered Hebrew. I read an interesting story of one farmer who had taken on to Harvard for one year, and he went through and named all of his animals with Hebrew names and put them above their stalls, you know, in colonial, in colonial America. And do you realize that it was until shortly after the Civil War that if you were the valedictorian at, ha at Harvard, that you had to give your valedictorian speech in Hebrew to the rest of the students. And they got, did away with that shortly after the Civil War. So this shows you part of the impact uh, that was had by discovering, in a sense, the Old Testament. Then you have the translation of the Bible into English, and they become familiar with this, learning the Old Testament stories, as I've already talked about, in detail, making comparisons to their everyday life, like we do. Then you have Puritans that develop Jude the Judeo-Christian whatever, 
and you have Bible study that produces, they start becoming premillennials. Most of the Puritans in the 1600s were premillennial. It wasn't until the 1700s that postmillennial comes in with Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s. Then you have the parallel struggles of Israel and England, et cetera. And then you had a guy named Francis Kett. He died in 1589, and he had a bachelor's and master's from Cambridge. He was a Puritan. He was both a pastor and a medical doctor. And he wrote the book, The Glorious and Beautiful Garland of Man's Glorification, uh, containing the godly mystery of heavenly Jerusalem. And Kett mentioned the notion of Jewish national return to Palestine, unquote. That's a quote out of his book. Guess what happened? For having that in his book, um, he was burned at the stake on January 15, 1589 in Norwich for advocating in his book the restoration of the Jews to Israel, an idea he claimed to have received from reading the Bible. Imagine that. And so the rise of Christian Zionism begins. And the first Christian Zionist that we know of, there, I'm sure there were others before him, is burned at the stake in England. Norwich, in the Middle Ages, was the second largest city in, in England. And it was the place in the 1200s where it had the highest Jewish population. And there's a famous story if you go there, it's not far from York, if you go there to Norwich about how they burned uh, a whole building full of Jews back in the 1200s and stuff. So Norwich is significant. Kent Kent said the Gentiles shall inquire after the root of Jesse and the Lord shall gather together the dispersed of Israel and the outcast of Judah, and then shall men rejoice before God as men make merry in harvest. In other words, it's going to be a happy day. These were new ideas. You're talking about medieval anti-Semitism that regularly killed Jews up to this point is what the church was into. So you have other Protestants, same time as catch strict Calvinist Edmund Bunny. I don't know if he hopped all over the place or what. He taught the Jewish restoration to Palestine in a couple of books. One was called The Scepter of Judah, 1584, and The Coronation of David, 1588. Not David Hawking, but uh, another David, the one he was named after. And here you have, in the 1600s, a flurry of books advocating a Jewish restoration to their land began to appear. Thomas Drake released in 1608, The World's Resurrection on the General Calling of the Jews, a familiar commentary upon the 11th chapter of St. Paul to the Romans according to the sense of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Drake argued for Israel's restoration based upon his Calvinism and covenant theology. Dare I say, Calvinism and covenant theology has taken a different turn in our day. It's used to argue for replacement theology, but here he used his covenant theology. In other words, God makes covenants and he keeps his word, therefore he's going to keep his word to Israel. I think people called dispensationalists have taken up that argument. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's what he argued then. Now, there were two major events in the late 1500s that led to the rediscovery of premillennialism, which once you have premillennialism, then you have uh, people thinking about Israel. Uh, there was the a footnote in the 1559 Geneva Bible in Romans 11 that made the comment that the Old Testament taught a Jewish restoration, in other words, the prophets. So that got people thinking. Secondly, the lost five chapters in 1583 were discovered of Irenaeus. In Irenaeus, I quoted, he was the most premillennial of the church fathers. And in the Middle Ages, they suppressed his last five chapters of his book called Against Heresy, uh, which taught, dealt with prophecy. So it's suppressed throughout the Middle Ages because they suppressed premillennialism. And it was rediscovered, and it was a real boost 
to the Puritans as they began to read the church fathers and began to return to premillennialism that the early church held, even though the Calvin and Luther did not. The two great giants of this era were Thomas Brightman, likely a postmillennialist, and a premillennialist named Joseph Mead. He's the father of British premillennialism. He's an Anglican which both wrote boldly of a future restoration of Israel. Brightman's work, Revelation of the Revelation. Man, how Lindsay could have used that title. It wasn't that paragraph long titles that they wrote back then where you didn't even have to read the book, you just had to read the title. Uh, appeared in 1609 and told how, quote, the Jews will return from the areas north and east of Palestine to Jerusalem and how the Holy Land and the Jewish Christian Church will become the center of a Christian world. See, it's still, the Jews are going to come back, but it's still Christendom that is dominant. Brightman wrote, what? Shall they return to Jerusalem again? There is nothing more certain. The prophecies you do everywhere confirm it. All right. That's exactly right. All you got to do is read the Bible and let Israel mean Israel. And Joseph Mead's contribution was released in 1627 in Latin and in 1642 in English, known as the key of the revelation. Here's the, the uh, page thing of his book. And he taught, uh, he thought of as the father of English premillennialism, and he was also an ardent advocate of Jewish restoration to their homeland. Momentum was certainly building toward widespread acceptance of English belief in Jewish restoration, but a few bumps in the road still lay ahead. So just think, we're coming from this time of uh, phenomenal anti-Judaism uh, in the Middle Ages to now when Protestantism is becoming known as people who believed in a future for Israel. Giles Fletcher, a fellow at King's College, Cambridge, and Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to Russia, wrote a work advocating restorationism. By the way, Christian Zionism in those days was called restorationism. You were a restorationist, one who believes Israel was going to go back to the land as a nation and be restored to the land. Fletcher's book, Israel Redux, or the Restitution uh, restoration of Israel or the restoration of Israel exhibited in two short essays or treaties. That's the shortened title. And that was published posthumously by the Puritan divine Samuel Lee in 1677. Fletcher cites a letter in his book from 1606 as he argues for the return of the Jews to the land. And Fletcher repeatedly taught the certainty of their return in God's due time. A key proponent for Israel's future restoration was Sir Henry Finch, who wrote a seminal work on the subject in 1621. Now, how many of y'all have heard of Blackstone's legal commentaries? Okay, and, and the important role they played in, in the development of Amer the American legal system coming out of England. Before there was Blackstone, there was Sir Henry Finch. He was the greatest legal scholar of his time in England, and he wrote commentaries on the law. Blackstone updated Sir Henry Finch's legal commentary. So this guy was a big time guy in England. He wasn't some guy just off the street. And his book was called The World's Resurrection or the Calling of the Jews, a present to Judah and the children of Israel that joined with him and to Joseph that valiant tribe of Ephraim and all the house of Israel that joined with him. Finch at the time of the publication of his book was a member of parliament and the most highly respected legal scholar in England at the time. And the book had been published for a matter only of weeks before the roof caved in on the author's head. In the persecution which ensued, Finch lost his reputation, his possessions, and his health, all precipitated by his belief in the Jewish national restoration. Finch's argument may be considered the first genuine plan for restoration. In other words, this is a five, six hundred page book that he laid it all out. And he taught that the biblical passages which speak of a return of these people to their own land, their conquest of enemies, and their rule of the nations are to be taken literally, not allegorically, as of the church. Wow, that's something worth, I mean, 
God, if you hold those beliefs, you could be dangerous like these wackos that live today are said to be, you see. King James of England was offended by Finch's statement that all the nations would become subservient to national Israel at the time of her, her restoration. Finch and his publisher were quickly arrested when his books were released by the High Commissioner. That was a censoring organization that censored books in England at the time, a creation of King James and examined. Finch was stripped of his status and possessions and then died a few years later. The doctrine of the restoration of the Jews continued to be expounded in England evolving according to the insight of each exponent and finally playing a role in Christian Zionistic activities in the later part of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. Poor old King James, he didn't want Jesus to reign over him, take his kingdom away from him, so he persecuted the guy. You're probably wondering, who's that handsome man? Everybody wonders. That's John Owen, the famous Puritan, and he was Cromwell's theologian. And many Puritans of the 17th century taught the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land. And one of the greatest Puritan theologians was John Owen, who wrote, quote, that he preached this in Parliament, the Jews shall be gathered from all parts of the earth where they are scattered and brought home into their homeland. So they're starting to read the Bible. You know, it, it's always helpful to read the Bible. The following list of 17th century English individuals that held the restoration views were John Milton, the famous poet who was a premillennialist, uh, John Bunyan, Roger Williams, John Sadler, and Oliver Cromwell himself. The doctrine of the restoration of the Jews continued to be expounded in England, evolving according to inside. I've already read that. Okay, and here is Cromwell's mandate that allowed the Jews to return to England in 1655. And uh, I'm sure you can read that, right? And right after this was issued, Parliament, the English Parliament, voted money to bring a boatload of Jews to England from Amsterdam in order to start repopulating the nation of Israel with Jewish people. So there were similar restorationist movements throughout Europe where the Reformation was strongest, but on a smaller scale. There was a number of restorations in Holland during the time of the Puritan movement. Isaac de la Perriere, uh, who served as the French ambassador to Denmark, wrote a book where, wherein he argued for a restoration of the Jews to Israel without conversion to Christianity. In other words, just what we believe, they're going to return in unbelief, and then they're going to be converted, you see? So that goes back to the 1600s. In 1655, Paul uh, Fellenhover wrote Good News for Israel, in which he taught that there would be the permanent return of the Jews to their own country, eternally bestowed upon them by God through the unqualified promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Unconditional promises, just what we believe that uh, the Abrahamic covenant is. Uh, the Danish guy, uh, Polly, believed wholeheartedly in the Jewish return to the Holy Land as a condition for the Second Coming. He even lobbied the kings of Denmark, England, and France to go and conquer Palestine from the Ottomans in order that the Jews could re regain their nation. And you had during this time all kinds of people from Germany, from England, going to the, you know, the head of the Ottoman Empire and trying to uh, get uh, permission for the Jews to return to their land. And these were Protestant Christians saying this, you see. And so, you know, Netanyahu in his book, A Place Among the Nations, in the first p section of it, acknowledges that the first Zionists in the history of the world were a bunch of Christians. And, we, and they were, even before the Jews, because they started reading the Bible. And that is widely recognized, at least among people who are knowledgeable of the history of Zionism. And then you have a Frenchman. Uh, I mean, if the French are involved, I mean, you know something's happening. <laughs> and he schemed with the Turkish ambassador in The Hague on a plan to defeat the Pope and trade the Papal Empire for return of the Jews of the Holy Land. 
and they thought we had uh, big imaginations. He was arrested in Hamburg and tried and convicted of high treason and died in prison a year later. Other European restorations of the era included Isaac Avasu, Hugo Grotius, who was a bad guy, the first Protestant preterist, Hugo Grotius. He invented the, the law of the sea, which is still important today that liberals are using to try to take over, uh, create a global government. Gerhard John uh, Vossus, uh, David Blondell, uh, Vassover Powell, uh, Joseph Ear, Edward Whitaker, and Charles Duran were some of the people. Now, as we move to colonial America, since the American colonies, especially in Puritan New England, were settled primarily by Englishmen who brought with them to the New World many of the same interests and beliefs that were circulating in the motherland, it is not surprising to find many zealous advocates in America for the restoration of the Jews. Perhaps the most influential of the early Puritan ministers in New England was John Cotton, who, following the post-millennialism of Brightman, held to the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land. In addition to John Cotton, early restorations include John Davenport, he was a missionary to the American Indians, uh, William Hooks, uh, Samuel Willard, uh, Samuel Sewell, Ephraim Height, a Cambridge-trained early minister in Windsor, Connecticut, believed that the Jews would be regathered to their homeland in 1650. So they're starting a date set now because they're historicists. Here is Increase Mather, uh, part of the what they call the Mather dynasty. His father, Richard, and Increase was born in the colonies, and he, he was a standout advocate of restorationist doctrine. And he's the son of Richard, father of Cotton, and he wrote a, over 100 books, 125 books that were published in his life, and was pr the second or third president of Harvard. His first work was The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. That's the first book he ever had published. It was his favorite book. It went through about a half dozen revisions, revisions during his life. His support of the national restoration of Israel to her land in the future was typical of American colonial Puritans and generally widespread. So, Increase Mather marries John Cotton's daughter and they name their son Cotton Mather. And the first salient school of thought in American history that advocated a national restoration of Jews to Palestine was resident in the first native-born generation at the close of the 17th century, in which Increase Mather played a dominant role. By the way, Richard Mather says in one of his books that all the colonists in Puritan uh, colonial America were premillennialist. The men who held this view were Puritans, and from that time on, the doctrine of restoration may be said to have become endemic to American culture. So our pro-Israel sentiment goes way back to the beginnings. We did not have medieval Roman c Catholicism in our background. America wasn't just founded by Christians, it was founded by Protestant Christians. And that made all the difference in the world. It was Increase Mather's view that this final and greatest reformation of the Christian world would be led by the Jewish people in suing upon their restoration to the Holy Land. From the earliest times, American Christianity had always tilted towards support of the restoration of national Israel in the Holy Land. American Christians, when compared with Euro-Asian Christianity, has always had a filio-Semitic disposition. Thus, it is not surprising that the tradition continues today, especially in dispensational circles. It's, it's starting to wane now as we become less and less Christian and move away. But here you have, for example, John Quincy Adams. And he was the sixth president, and he was a big time Christian Zionist. And it should not be considered strange that President Adams expressed his desire that the Jews again were in Judah not uh, an independent nation once restored to an independent government and no longer persecuted. Uh, by the way, Cotton Mather, Increase Mather's son, wrote 425 books that were published back in the day. He wrote more that weren't. They didn't have video games and television and stuff. Uh, a little more serious culture than 
I don't think they were people who believed in hanging loose. <laughs> if you know what I mean, Vern. Uh, they were people who believed in being engaged and involved in things. Okay, but Adams wanted to see this. Abraham Lincoln expressed his desire uh, for Israel to be restored as a homeland. He says it's a noble dream shared by many Americans, and he thought it would be a great idea as well. You have uh, real advocates of Christian Zionism in Britain who were primarily Anglican premillennialists. By the mid-19th century, about half of all Anglican clergy were evangelical premillennialists. In other words, think of that. That's the Church of England. And there are two great times in the history of British Christianity, the 1600s and the 1800s. And in the 1800s, you had a very high proportion of the aristocracy that became not just Christians, but evangelical, Bible-believing, premillennial Christians. And so if you have in the Anglican church, the state church, over half of the clergy it, around 1850 were premillennial. So that, so that meant that they were not only evangelical, but they believed in the premillennial return of Christ. Ian Murray said some 700 ministers of the establishment were said to believe that Christ's coming must precede his kingdom upon earth. This was in 1845. I've seen other things, 1858, 1848, etc. Murray went on to add that the number almost certainly increased in the latter half of the century. Here's an example of one of those guys. You ever heard of J.C. Ryle? Some of y'all probably have his commentaries. He uh, w uh, wrote a pre he wrote a premillennial creed <laughs> that was anti-postmillennial, and Charles Spurgeon, among others, signed it indicating that they obviously were premillennial. And so the wave of premillennialism is what produced in Britain a crop of Christian Zionists that led to political activism, which likely cul culminated in the Balfour Declaration. And here's a very important person in England, Lord Shaftesbury. If you go to London, there's Shaftesbury Road or Street. And he is considered even more than um, the guy who preceded him, who they made the movie out of, freed the, uh, did away with slavery. Wilberforce. He was considered a much greater social legislator than Wilberforce. Anthony Ashley Cooper, later Lord Shaftesbury, is said by Barbara Tuckman to have been the most influential non-political figure excepting Darwin of the Victorian age. And as a strong evangelical Anglican, he is said to have based his life upon a literal acceptance of the Bible and was known as the evangelical of the evangelicals. He was a guy that the prime minister and the queen or king let appoint all the bishops in the Anglican church. So that's why they had all these premillennial guys in there. Shaftesbury was the greatest influence for social legislation in the 19th century. And... Uh, Here's a guy named Edward Bickerstaff. That was the only picture I could find. <laughs> and this is the guy, this is an Anglican clergyman who led uh, Shaftesbury into his premillennial views, which then gave rise to the Jewish restoration. And Shaftesbury said concerning his belief in the second coming that it has always been a moving principle in my life for I see everything going on in the world subordinate to the great event. And it, because of his premillennialism, Shaftesbury became greatly involved as chairman of the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews. And he spearheaded a movement that led to the creation by the Church of England of an Anglican bishopric in Jerusalem with a converted Jew consecrated as its first bishop. Now now, the guy who's the bishop over there is some pro-Palestinian guy. But originally, they got it to protect the Jews. The British wanted to have a, have a foothold in Jerusalem to help the Jews who were being persecuted all the time by the Ottoman Empire. And there are many instances where they would come in and defend the Jews uh, from this bishopric. In fact, Shaftesbury's daughter and her husband later went to uh, Israel as missionaries to the Jews to evangelize them. And he said, oh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
were the words in, engraved on a ring that he always wore on his right hand, on the inside of his ring. Since Shaftesbury believed that the Jews would return to their homeland in conjunction with the Second Advent, he never had a shadow of a doubt that the Jews were to return to their homeland, own land. It was his daily prayer, his daily hope. In 1840, Shaftesbury was known for coining a slogan that was often repeated throughout his life, that the Jews were a country without a nation for a nation without a country. In other words, because Palestine or Israel was basically barren, as Mark Twain's visit there indicates and documents. Shaftesbury's greatest contribution to the restoration movement was his attempt to accomplish something in the political realm in order to provoke England to develop a policy in favor of returning the Jews to their homeland. He succeeded in influencing England to adopt that policy, but England failed at the time to influence the Turks, who wouldn't allow it. So in 1838, in an article in the Quarterly Review, Shaftesbury put forth the view that Palestine could become a British colony of the Jews that, quote, could provide Britain with cotton, silk, herbs, and olive oil. In other words, they had to have a pragmatic reason, but his real reason was the Bible. And so I'm going to stop right here and pick up in my next talk this afternoon and finish this history of Christian Zionism as we see it coming to America and having eventually leading to the establishment of Israel. God used godly, Bible-believing Christians to help establish the modern state of Israel. And he can use you and I in a similar way to use the issues relating to Israel to preach the gospel to our friends and also to help support uh, Israel. America is different than Europe. And the reason isn't because there's some great Jewish lobby in Washington. It's because of the Christians that have a swing influence in the United States. Just as in Europe, the Muslims have a swing influence toward anti-Semitism. But they say that our influence is waning and we claim that we get this desire for Israel from the Bible. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have a plan for history and you are bringing people to yourself, to Christ, but you are, have a plan for your people, Israel. It's through Israel that your kingdom is going to come. It was through a Jewish man, Jesus, that salvation has come to the world. It is through Israel and, and Jewish disciples that the Bible was written. And once again, you're not finished with your people. God has not cast off his people whom he foreknew, but you are going to have a grand ending for Israel, and that's why you've brought your people back to the land in, in anticipation of these end time events. And so we as people who believe the book, the Bible, we anticipate what you have done and we look back in gratitude to those that have gone before in the church who bucked the tide of the popular notions that God was finished with Israel, but we know from the book that you're not. And so help us to be people that follow the book in every detail that where we're to bring the gospel to all peoples, but nevertheless, we ha have a soft spot in our heart for the nation of Israel because of your selection of them. And so be with us throughout the rest of this conference as we learn th from your Bible what your plan is for your people, the church, and Israel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.